Hello, Grace Lutheran. This Thursday's theologian is Origen of Alexandria. I imagine most of our listeners have never heard of Origen, and if you have, it was probably in a sermon or in a book somewhere, and you didn't really have time to look into who he was or what he believed. But for those who want to undertake any kind of study within theology, or even within early church history, it's impossible to avoid the influence and the significance of Origen's work in the early church. Like any other significant figure in the course of history, Origen is a very controversial person. Some consider him the greatest Christian teacher to come after the apostles, and still others believe that he's a heretic that we should have absolutely nothing to do with. To start our discussion on Origen, I thought a good place to start would be to take a look at a well-known icon of Origen of Alexandria. Now, I don't know the original source of this icon, Uh, but I think it's a great starting place to understand the church's historical attitude toward this figure, Origen. Up on your screen, you should see an image of Origen on the right-hand side teaching from a podium, while a group of saints are down below listening to him. If you look closely among the saints, you'll find uh, Gregory the Theologian, uh, Melania the Elder, uh, you see Gregory of Nyssa, Maximus the Confessor, and then if you look all the way in the back, you'll see John Chrysostom's halo. These are some of the greatest and most influential church fathers and mothers who came years after Origen. And yet here we see them listening and submitting to Origen's teachings. If you look at the scroll that Origen's holding, you can see that it reads, Attend above all else to the reading of the scriptures. And I believe that statement is a great summary of Origen's attitude of Holy Scripture. Uh, Despite all of his other faults that we'll be talking about, Uh, you cannot deny that Origen loved the scriptures. Now, in taking a closer look at this picture, you may notice that Origen is missing something really important that all of the other saints below him seem to have. If you look at the saints and you look at Origen, you can see pretty clearly that Origen doesn't have a halo. Now, isn't that interesting that we have this figure who is standing in a position of authority, and some of the greatest church fathers and mothers that we have are in a position of submission to him, and yet the artist seems to suggest that Origen may or may not be a Christian. I believe this is the tension that we have to live in when we study Origen and read some of the things he wrote. On one hand, I don't think there's any denying the genius of Origen and his profound gifted wisdom and insight into the scriptures that he passes on to those that come after him. Uh, But at the same time, I think we also have to approach Origen cautiously uh, because he does have a lot of ideas that don't seem to be taught in Holy Scripture. Before we talk about some of Origen's ideas, I think it is worth giving some historical context to Origen. Origen was born in 190 AD, so much of his theology and his writing develops in the early 200s AD. We're fairly certain Origen was born in Alexandria, Egypt, which is where he would eventually go on to gain his namesake for his writings and theology. Origen's father was a teacher, so he raised Origen in a very educated household. Uh, Apparently, he even forced Origen to memorize uh, large portions of scripture, of Greek plays, uh, even as a young boy. Unfortunately, when Origen was only 17, the persecution against Christians became really, really strong in Alexandria. So Origen's father was eventually arrested for his faith. After his father's arrest, Origen is adamant about joining him and walking down to the jailhouse and announcing his faith too. Uh, But apparently, as the story goes, Origen's mother uh, hid Origen's clothes from him so he wasn't able to get dressed in time to alert the authorities of his Christianity. Sadly, Origen's father was killed for his faith, so Origen has to go on to support his family financially, so he gets a job as a grammar teacher, much like his father. Even as a young man early on in his career, Origen shows a mastery of both Greek philosophy and Holy Scripture. For some, this is the exact problem with Origen. Uh, Some will say that he wasn't so much a Christian doing Greek philosophy as he was a Greek philosopher trying to do Christianity. While I can see why that criticism is raised against Origen, I still think it's cutting him just a little too short, uh, and we'll see why as we go along and study some of his ideas. 
at the age of 65, Origen is finally arrested for his Christian faith and thrown into prison. And while Origen is never officially martyred or killed for his Christianity, uh, he does eventually succumb to the abuse and the neglect that he suffered in prison. And at the age of 70, Origen dies. Now, at this point, some of you may still be wondering, and understandably so, uh, what is the big deal with this guy, Origen? Uh, he seems to have some really weird ideas. It's in question whether he was actually a Christian or not. Uh, so why are we sitting here talking about him? Well, first, we give Origen credit for writing the first systematic theology work called On First Principles. While we know there were numerous writers between the apostles and Origen who give us very deep theology, there really wasn't an organized work that detailed every aspect of what Christians believed. In other words, while there were a lot of Christian writings at this point that covered a big range of topics, there was really nothing compiled yet that went into detail about everything Christians believe about individual doctrines, uh, such as everything Christians believe about God the Father, and then everything Christians believe about Jesus Christ, everything they believe about the Holy Spirit. And this is essentially what On First Principles is. It's an attempt to explain every detail of Christian belief. Origen's next greatest contribution is a work that we unfortunately no longer have the entirety of, uh, but this is a work called the Hexapla. This was a huge undertaking of Origen's to compare six different translations of the Old Testament. The Hexapla was organized into six columns, each containing a different translation of the Old Testament. It contained first the original Hebrew text, and then it had the Hebrew text in Greek letters. And then the remaining four were different popular Greek translations of the Old Testament that were being used at this time. Now, I'm not being overly dramatic when I say that this was a masterpiece in the ancient world. It took Origen 20 years to compile this. This was used by some of the greatest church fathers in the West, such as St. Jerome and St. Augustine. This was a huge work that changed the way that the church did theology. Unfortunately, by the 7th century AD, Origen's bad reputation had gotten the better of him, and many copies of the Hexapla were ordered to be burned. But when it comes to Origen's own ideas, what he is perhaps most known for, and what often lands him in the most hot water, is this idea of the allegorical interpretation of Scripture. To understand this idea of allegory, or allegorical interpretation, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 4. In chapter 4, beginning at verse 22, Paul writes, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically, these women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. So to read something allegorically is to bring out the spiritual meaning of the text or the meaning that lies behind the plain, literal sense of the words. So when Paul reads Genesis and sees the story of Abraham and his relationship with his wives, Sarah and Hagar, Paul interprets that allegorically, or in other words, seeing a spiritual sense of the text that points to the reality of a covenant of works or covenant of law that the Jews are held to in Paul's day versus the covenant of grace delivered through Jesus Christ. For Paul, he sees that Hagar symbolizes the covenant of law and that Sarah represents the covenant of grace because she delivers Isaac, the son of the promise. Now keep in mind, the book of Genesis never says any of this explicitly. And you can imagine that Paul was criticized by a lot of Jewish contemporaries who saw this and said, you're just inserting your new Christianity into the Jewish scriptures. So Origen sees what Paul's doing to this passage in the book of Genesis 
And he asks, what if we took that same approach and applied it to the rest of the Old Testament? Origen believed that there were several ways to interpret a particular text, but he believed that this allegorical interpretation, the same interpretation Paul used, is the true interpretation or the interpretation that we as Christians should seek after when we're reading the Old Testament. For Origen, this allegorical or spiritual interpretation should always point us to Jesus Christ. So the allegorical interpretation is always going to be thoroughly and specifically Christian. I believe that there's a lot of good that can come out of this allegorical approach to the Old Testament, and I'm probably more sympathetic to it than most Lutheran pastors probably are. Uh, Martin Luther himself was an outspoken critic of origin and a lot of his allegorical approach. But today, I believe there's this prevailing attitude, especially in America, that treats the Old Testament as a collection of books that we share with the Jewish religion, as if to say that they have as much claim to authority over these books as Christians do. But let's take a look at what Jesus says at the end of the Gospel of Luke. This is after the resurrection. Jesus is addressing his disciples, uh, and this is what he says. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So Jesus is saying that the Old Testament, which is what he means by Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, were written to fulfill his coming into the world, and that his death, resurrection, and repentance and forgiveness of sins, all of these things are contained and prophesied in the Old Testament. This doesn't just mean the prophets, it doesn't just mean the Messianic Psalms, but Jesus says all of the Old Testament, all of the law, all of the prophets, all of the Psalms point to who he is and what he has come to accomplish for us. So as Christians, our confession should always be that the Old Testament is a thoroughly Christian collection of works. It's not something that we share with another faith. It's not something that holds any other truth claims outside of the claims of Christ. But the Old Testament has always been and was always intended to be a Christian holy book, a part of the Christian holy scriptures. So if we understand this to be the case, then Origen proposes that we should see numerous examples of things that foreshadow or point to Christ and what he's done. So far, all of this sounds well and good. And in fact, I've used the allegorical approach as a useful tool in a lot of my preaching. But it doesn't take long to see how this approach can be taken too far, especially if it's done so in a way that ignores the historical interpretation of the text. While I don't believe Origen ever goes so far as to say that the historical interpretation is completely unimportant or doesn't matter at all to our theology, you can see how his approach and how his favoring of the allegorical interpretation can lead itself to these kinds of mistakes. As Christians, I believe Jesus invites us to find his presence in the Old Testament, but it should never be done in a way that is forced or imposes some previous ideas onto the pages of Holy Scripture. While we're talking about some of these big criticisms, it may be worth taking a moment to talk about uh, some of the big ideas that Origen had that he gets the most flack for. First, and this one's probably the biggest, Origen believed in universalism, or the idea that all people who've ever lived, whether they had faith in Jesus Christ or not, will one day be reconciled to God through Christ. And for Origen, this even included the devil. To be fair to Origen, he wasn't alone in this. We have several other early church fathers who shared in a similar belief, such as Gregory of Nyssa. But this is something that we can't follow Origen along with. Uh, we have very clear passages in Scripture that talk about the danger and the eternality of hell for those who do not have faith in Jesus Christ. 
another strange belief of origins is this idea that the human soul is eternal and that the human body is temporary. So Origen believed that human souls existed eternally alongside God from the very beginning, but that they take shape in their human bodies when they are created. Without dwelling on this too much, this has a lot of implications for how we see things like the incarnation, salvation, uh, the historic orthodox position of the church has been that the human soul and the human body uh, both come into being at their conception or their creation. Suffice it to say, Origen has several beliefs that would put him outside of orthodoxy today. And for that reason alone, I don't think it's necessarily unfair to question or perhaps raise some concerns about some of Origen's teachings. But to defend Origen just a little bit, we have to remember that he's writing at a time before there was any kind of Christian resource material. You know, it's not like he had access to Logos Bible software or all of these Christian commentaries that we have access to today. While I believe we should always take the mistakes that Origen makes very seriously, I encourage people not to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to Origen and not dismiss all of the good things that he has to contribute to both church history and to our own lives as Christians today. Origen challenges us to see the unity that exists in Holy Scripture, not as a Jewish Old Testament and a Christian New Testament, but as a completed work bound together by the Holy Spirit that points its readers to the person of Christ. If we're reading the Old Testament and come across something that sounds like it's hinting at or foreshadowing the person of Christ, then we should be comfortable saying that it likely is because that's the whole point of the text. At the end of these episodes, I like to do book recommendations from my own library that were written by this particular theologian. And all of my works from Origen are contained in just this one volume of the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Uh, this is volume four and it has five works of Origen's. Uh, one of them is on first principles. Another is an apologetic work called Against Celsus, and then the other three works are letters that Origen wrote to various people. If you're more interested with how Origen and other early church fathers used this allegorical approach, uh, then I would recommend this book by Christopher Hall called Reading Scripture with the Church Fathers. Uh, now this is part of a set, uh, but this one deals specifically with how the church fathers read Holy Scripture. And so it does go into detail about the allegorical approach, the history, uh, how other church fathers were using it. Uh, so if that's a topic that interests you, then this is a, a great resource. That's going to be it for this Thursday's Theologian. I unfortunately don't have as many books for Origin as I did for Bonhoeffer last week. Uh, but as always, I'm taking recommendations for theologians that you'd like to learn more about in this similar format. Uh, but until then, I hope you have a great rest of your week, and God bless.